and Latifa to get our conversation started. Tell us a little bit about your early life in Kandahar, living in the family compound, and especially your parents. It's my pleasure to be invited. Thank you, Debbie, for um, having me on your TNN uh, webinar. And um, yeah, I'm Latifa Yusufi Woodhouse, and uh, I grew up in Kandahar, Afghanistan in my early life. Um, and the compound that we lived in Kandahar was um, fascinating as a child, I would say. Uh, I was born to a mother that was uh, 13 years old when she got married and um, 14 years old when she gave me birth. So um, as, a, as a young baby, of course, I didn't know anything except my mother telling me how uh, devastated she was because in Kandahar at that time, the birth of a daughter was um, a shameful thing, especially if it's your first child. So my mother, who was a young woman herself, um, almost, you know, a child, did not know much about uh, bringing up a baby. But uh, my dad, luckily, was uh, much older than my mom. He was 24 years old. And uh, with his support and attention, um, I, you know, survived and I did well, although um, the family of my father, that was a big family, uh, they all lived together in um, the household, which is my grandmother, my father's sister, my father's brothers, although the compound had different houses, but they were all interconnected. So they lived in their own quarters, but they would all come together for dinners and socializing. And um, they resented the fact that my mother was uh, not able to give birth to a baby boy as a firstborn. And uh, so from that experience, you know, as I was growing up and, um, you know, I noticed at age two and three that my mother was pretty much, you know, not treated very well. But when my brother was born, it was a whole different story. My brother's birth uh, changed the entire attitude of everyone towards my mom. And, um, you know, it was... It was a uh, quite um, uh, interesting the way I, through my, um, you know, eyes that I saw how, from very early childhood, women were treated and how women were diminished, basically, and treated as second-class citizen. So that is where I got my my uh, fire for women's rights and for how women should be treated. So does that answer your question, Deb? I guess it does. Um, now, your, your father was a businessman. He was more westernized than, I guess, a lot of the more traditional men in your village. Uh, how, how did that impact him and you? My father's first job was actually he was a teacher. Um, he was a teacher of geometry and algebra. Um, in his young days when, uh, you know, that's before I was born. But yes, when I um, was born and my brother was born, he was a businessman and a president of Chamber of Commerce in Kandahar. And um, he traveled a lot, um, you know, all over um, Western countries and um, um, to uh, Eastern countries like India in, you know, the Middle East, Beirut was his favorite city. And um, he, w because of being Westernized, uh, he would bring a lot of, um, you know, gifts and ideas and books and literature and art to the house, which does, you know, have impact on you know, it did have impact on my life and my brothers and, you know, my mother um, and in a, in a very different way because we felt like we were living in that other world. But again, it was Kandahar, Afghanistan. The community around us was not uh, very civilized, and uh, um, but the household was. And that made me also, because of literature and art and music, that, you know, uh, I got these Western ideas. And uh, the first book that I read uh, was Anne Frank's book. When I was um, 
seven, eight years old. And I read it in English because I had English tutors all, you know, from childhood. Like in, at age four, I was taught Arabic and Persian. You know, Pashto is my real native language. In age, age six, I had tutors for English. So I happened to speak English very well from, you know, very early childhood. And then at age seven, I read the book, um, you know, uh, of uh, Anne Frank. And I felt like I was Anne Frank too, because even though I lived in this lovely household, but there was nothing, you know, my mother was treated pretty poorly by my aunts and, and uncles. And I felt like, what's going on? You know, I was a, a female and my brother was a male and the treatment was very, very different. So, um even though, you know, the, the treatment in the house was different, but my father's influence of his westernization in bringing the Western culture to our household um, really taught me a lot. And I found that um, only through education, I could make, you know, my way out to the Western world. How did you convince your, your father to allow you to, to get an education. As I said, he was a teacher himself and he believed in education and he was the first son of my grandfather's nine son that took the liberty to send his first uh, female daughter to secular school. None of my uh, grandfather's 28 um, granddaughters were allowed to go to secular school. They were all home, t home tutored by uh, women called Moraz. Moraz is like the imams, the female imams of um, the religion, and they would come and they basically taught religion to these um, young women, um, and maybe some geography and history, but not so much. But my dad took the liberty and uh, went against all of his, um, you know, uh, families, rituals, and traditions, and enrolled me at age four in kindergarten. And um, that created um, a little bit uproar for him from the community and from his brothers. Um, but um, he went, you know, he said he wanted education for his daughter in secular school because according to my uncles and my aunts, secular school was the devilish way and you were eyes open and you learn about the world. And that was not um, a good thing for a female to um, you know, learn. But um, dad went against all of that. And that was wonderful. And that got me into the uh, secular school uh, until sixth grade. Sixth grade, um, you know, as I was going to seventh grade, um, that's the time, you know, I hit puberty. And um, that was a very, very uh, dramatic shift in my life because my dad, um, you know, uh, had a conversation with me about, well, you know, I, I took the liberty and I community went against me. My uh, family went against me to uh, send you to secular school. Right now that you are at this age, um, there are two choices that you have to make. Um, either you have to wear the burqa, which is a tent like uh, Schrode, most of you have probably have seen it at the New York Times or the, the National Geographic, you know, they call it Chadari also in Farsi, but Burka in Pashto, that um, you would have to wear that to be covered to go to continue your seventh grade. Or if you are not going to, um, you know, continue your secular school, then you would have to stay home and be taught by Moraz, just like your um, cousins are taught, female cousins. And um, wow, that was that was uh, uh, really, uh, I mean, it was a two months of crying and uh, arguments and back and forth conversations that finally, um, you know, I s decided that, okay, I will wear the burqa, but I'm not going to let the school, um, the secular school go. So uh, I, I made that decision and my father was happy with that. And I did um, uh, wear that burqa, which now my book is called Latifa Unveiled because I was a veiled woman from uh, seventh grade till 12th grade um, in Kandahar. But uh, through, of course, good friends and uh, people from, you know, uh, different class of families like the, the daughter of the governor or the daughter of the mayor, you know, uh, I found my ways how to 
um, manipulate the system by, um, I always say that I lived two lives at that time because um, I found, uh, you know, one of my friends said, hey, you know, because I was very embarrassed, you know, mind you, you're at the age of puberty and, and you are with all these other girls, it's a girls' school, um, that none of them are wearing the burqa. And the reason I had to wear the burqa because I come from a long line of 20 generation of Imam, Mullahs, clerics, and um, all the intellectuals of the religion of Islam. So I was forced to do that. And I was embarrassed. I didn't want to go inside the school with this uh, um, cover from top to toe and be sitting in a seat with other girls who didn't have that. So one of my friends said, hey, you know, in the neighborhood about um, three blocks away, there is like this whole neighborhood of Hindus, you know, the Hindu of Afghanistan, which they're Indian and their religion is Hindu. So why don't you go and, um, you know, maybe they could keep your burqa for a certain amount of money and ask, and I'll go with you. And so she did go with me, and I said, fine, you know, I'll do that. But I said, that would be a lie to my parents. And she said, well, you, you know, it, what do you want to do? You make the decision. I did make the decision to lie about, um, you know, where uh, what I was doing because my parents required and I agreed that I'll be wearing the burqa. And then I found this um, Indian woman's house and went to her house and had a meeting with her and she said, look, I've heard um, that, you know, we, that you speak English very well. I said, how do you know that? She says, oh, you know, because Kandahar is a small city and people know about each other. And she said, we really need my two sons. You know, they were young uh, boys, fourth grade and sixth grader that, you know, they could um, benefit. Uh, I don't need money, but if you could tutor them. So that's how my whole journey of tutoring um, and uh, keeping my burqa in her house every morning, you know, because I was driven by a driver. We had a driver, um, and that's what life was in Afghanistan. My father had a car, but you never drive yourself. You know, the driver drives you. The driver would drop me off in front of the school. Then I had to walk back to that Indian um, house and then leave my burqa there and then come right, uh, you know, like uh, during uh, – right after school i would call my parents that you know we have after school activity or whatever and i would go and uh, tutor the kids twice a week and um, the lady kept my burqa well that didn't i mean it did last for two years but uh, then in 11th grade my driver found out that um you know i was doing that uh, that i was going somewhere else and leaving my burqa and he uh, said that he's going to tell on me and that was another problem um, because, you know, he wanted uh, favors from me as a male that, you know, because I, first I promised him my allowance and then that was not enough. Uh, that is a whole big long story that I would appreciate if you could purchase my book to read about what a life is like, not only with all the oppression of, you know, wearing the burqa and, and uh, being afraid and living two lives, but now the driver is also making uh, moves on you and want, uh, you know, to, to do things to you unless, you know, you give in and they he will tell your father or your mother about what you're doing. So, um, you know, it it was it was very very difficult, um, not easy during those years. Uh, the life that I lived, I was very very happy in the school, what I was learning. But I always thought that there is a light at the end of the tunnel, and there is always through education. I saw my way through education. And by the way, we're you know we are are just hitting the, the tip of the iceberg with, with these stories today. There, there's so much more in the book. You know, it's, it's really just her, her whole life, which was just, I just think is so fascinating. Um, now, you, you were going to school at this point when you were a teenager, but other girls in your situation were being married off. 
right arranged marriages? Yeah, I mean, in those days, you know, like I told you about, my mom was married at age 13. You know, girls were married at age 13, 14, 15. Th those were the ages. Uh, after 15, you were too old, you know. Uh, you were no longer a commodity <laughs> to be sold. And, you know, in Afghanistan, there is that dowry thing, you know, it's a uh, reverse of India. And in Afghanistan, the, the woman gets, uh, you know, like the woman is sold uh, for a certain amount of uh, money or belongings or, you know, all of, you know, so the parents have to be given. But that was a fortunate thing that I was not forced to get married. And I continued my secular education and my parents really were in support of my education but of course because of the community in the the place that we live in in the generation of imams that my background was they wanted to protect me and protect them from the uproar of the community so then you um you actually uh got your father to allow you to go to college in Kabul. Well, that wasn't really easy in, in a decision because once I got into, um, see, there's there's a whole story about that. There's another chapter of how, you know, my father promised me, he ran for um, Senate, that if he wins, then we will all move to Kabul. And Kabul was a much more progressive city. And then I will be allowed to go to college, um, you know, and without a burqa because that's a different city and there's not the, all the Kandaris and the imams and the mosques and, you know, the people that are really threatening my father's life and my, um, you know, household and my mother. So, unfortunately, well, fortunately, my father won. Unfortunately, the politics are very dirty everywhere, especially in Afghanistan. And the king invited both my dad and the other uh, gentleman that I'm not going to name because he's very famous uh, uh, person. <laughs> so so the, the he's right now dead, but his son is very, very well known. So uh, what happened was the king asked, like, West, look, uh, this tribe of this person is very well known in Kandahar and mm, promised to my father, you gave all the votes back to him or let let make him the senator, but we will give you the ministry of theology because of your background in, in theology and religion. And that was a promise that King Zayr Shah made to my dad, but unfortunately that um, did not manipulate anything. And my father um, came back and he continued his um, job as the, um, well, at that time, when that happened, he was the mayor of Zabul. So he continued that job. Um, Zabul is the third province of Afghanistan. And um, then, you know, because these are all elective positions and, and stuff. Uh, and, and then my father um, was not, you know, given the, the position. And uh, I still was, you know, um, wanting to go. So for two years, I went to high teachers college in Kandahar. That was the only way I could continue my further education. But from that, uh, my brother-in-law, Rasul, uh, who um, was, you know, a, a person, a very well-educated person and worked for the Ministry of Education, and uh, told my dad that your daughter is very talented and why don't, you know, I take her to take the Concord exam and see what happens? Because that was the time that the first dorm for girls was... Um, open in Kabul. And um, dad gave me permission in um, Mr. Khushbin, which is my brother-in-law, and I went to Kabul uh, University and took the Concord exam, which is like a special SET uh, exam it would be here. And I got the highest grade to be in the third grade of college um, of a faculty of education. So that was like announced everywhere in the hallways of Kabul universities. And, and my brother-in-law called my dad and said, you should be proud of your 
uh, daughter, you know, she got accepted with very high grades and um, she will be living in the dorm if you allow and you're welcome to come and see the dorm and all that. And my dad did come to Kabul and uh, visited with the dorm director. It was all girls dorm. He made sure he, you know, gave my curfew hours to the director and to the um, guards at the gate that, you know, just for my own protection, according to my dad, that I should be uh, home by, uh, or at the dorm by five o'clock, and I'm not allowed anywhere in the evening, and all of that was done, and uh, I was uh, the happiest person, and I went to um, Faculty of Education and got my master, no, I'm sorry, my BA, and teaching English as a second language. You were also uh helping teach uh, Peace Corps? At that time, good, good, good question, because at that time, since I was um, speaking English very well, and I, you know, I was a student at a high, uh, the um, Faculty of Education, you know, and, and before that, when I was in Kandahar, I had gotten to know, um, you know, I was a teacher. Um, be, first, when I graduated from, um, I knew, uh, from Zarguna High School, Right away, since I was the third girl of the class in terms of grades, you know, there are like 34 girls. If you're first, second, and third, you get a job right away. So I got a job right away at the um, another uh, high school that was called I Know Lisa. And in that high school, I met um, a Peace Corps volunteer, Kathy Jeremiah from Nebraska, who was an English teacher and she and I became very very good friends and actually she was like my dad's adopted daughter and my grandmother would make all the um, you know uh, toshaks which is like the Afghan you know tatami mats kind of thing and in blankets and in uh, they they decorated all her house you know Kathy was uh, a wonderful amazing friend to me and my American sister and through her I got connection she you know in encouraged me, look, your English is so great, why don't you apply for Peace Corps? And I did, and I got a job and uh, got trained by the American Peace Corps office in Kabul um, to be an instructor for American Peace Corps volunteers and uh, Kabul um, and uh, also be their cultural advisor. So through those venues, I had an opportunity to travel all over Afghanistan and be with Peace Corps volunteers in teach them, you know, this was men, women, engineer, nurses, professors, uh, you know, and, and they came to Afghanistan, but they had these titles and these uh, um, responsibilities to go to different provinces after they learned the language and the culture. So my job as a cultural advisor and a language teacher, which I taught Pashto in Farsi to uh, most of them was to take them around the country to show them, but it w I was not alone. You know, there was a whole group of us, uh, and um, that was quite an amazing, eye-opening experience for me to get to know more about American culture, American ways, and teach them our ways and, uh, you know, the Afghan ways, like in Afghanistan, women are not allowed to wear um, sleeveless shirt or they are not allowed to wear shorts. And so my American wonderful students would come with their, you know, mini skirts were very popular that, those days. And then they would have, and then I would take them shopping and they would buy these materials and just uh, sew them to their sleeveless shirt so the the sleeves would be one color and the dress would be another color it was just it was funny but it was interesting how they had to adapt to the culture of the country um and it was quite an amazing experience for me and a lot of learning and from that then i got a job with usaid as uh, the secretary for um dr brown who was the president of the usaid and then i really got into much more of the um high class american culture you know joined their parties and uh, got to know many many you know contractors and uh, really and, and taught also the drivers um the afghan drivers english at usaid and being a secretary of dr brown so that gave me more exposure to the american culture and then 
all of them would recommend, hey, I know nothing about Fulbright. Why don't you take a Fulbright exam because your English is so good? Well, yes, that was it. When Ambassador Elliot, I was his tutor. Uh, this was the American ambassador to Afghanistan in Kabul, and he suggested I should take the Fulbright exam, and it, you know, there's a Fulbright office in Kabul um, city, and I went and took the exam, and from 400 students uh, from all over Afghanistan, I was, uh, you know, the five students passed the written test, and from five students, two of us, a young man from the Wardak province, and me, the only woman from Kandahar, Afghanistan, the most conservative city of the uh, country and in the world, I would say, because it's the birthplace of the Taliban, um, I got the Fulbright Scholarship. And that was such an honor to my family and to the entire city of Kandahar, even though they're very conservative, but they said, wow, this woman, you know, Yusufi's daughter, uh, and they call him Raisa, Raisa means the president's daughter, got a scholarship to the United States of America. That was a huge deal. So that's how I got into the United States on a Fulbright scholarship, which governors of Jalalabad, governors of Kandahar, you know, all the dignitary came to say goodbye to me. And um, my dad was very, very happy and uh, uh, wished me uh, good luck and um, gave me lots of gifts and uh, with the hope that I, you know, I'll come to America, get my education and go back to Afghanistan and teach um, there. But that was, um, that did not happen. While you were at university, you mm -hmm. met a man named Colin Woodhouse. That's correct. And yeah. Tell, tell us a little bit about Colin. Uh, how did Colin and I meet? Because I was a Peace Corps teacher, but, you know, I would see, like, there are a lot of Peace Corps volunteers. You know, some are professors, like I said earlier. Some are um, the nurses, and some are engineers, and some are electricians. But I knew Colin from far away, like, you know, when, when there would be big parties in the president's house, we would all go. But I never knew anything about him or didn't even know that he was a professor at the University of Kabul, which I was a student. So there was an ad at the university paper for students who spoke English very well for a play of Ernest Hemingway, the uh, killer. The play was called The Killer. And that play um, was advertised in my uh, um, fellow, you know, students encouraged me, my friends, hey, you'd be the best candidate for this play. Your English is so good. Why don't you answer this ad? Well, I answered the ad, and uh, that was, uh, Colin was the director of that play. And um, so I passed the test, apparently, and I was selected as a, one of his play character. And uh, unfortunately, the role that I got uh, in that play was the little old lady who's the cleaning lady. So I had long, dark hair at that time, and then I had to put all this white powder and make it really like a, an older lady, a cleaning lady, and all of that. So I played that role in the play, and we had many, many rehearsals and many, many times gotten together um, with uh, two of my other um, Afghan friends, uh, girls, uh, you know, and, and many Afghan boys. So then... There was a cast party. At the cast party, Colin invited all of us um, to his house. And in that cast party, I found out that Colin had much more special interest in me than anyone else. And I was interested in, like, but of course, you know, he's an American and, you know, I'm from Afghanistan, from this well-known family, and I'm a proper Afghan Muslim woman. So I had the, the, the feelings, but could not express or anything. And then and during conversation, he asked me that, um, you know, I did a terrific job and if I could be his private tutor um, to teach him um, the Pashto and Farsi. And um, I said, okay, I will do that. Um, so the next week, was, you know, our time and, and place that I went to his house to teach him. And that didn't last very long because uh, the week after he invited me to a, 
uh, you know, some parties that they had in their house, and Colin was a great, he still is, harmonica player. And he played harmonica with the band, and uh, then um, that day, you know, I was there at the party, and um, of course, um, I had that curfew, so I couldn't go back to the dorm, and he was very kind and nice, and he asked some of his uh, American friends from the um, USAID to take me to their house, a couple, um, and sleep, and then in the morning, we'll come back and go to, for breakfast, and during that breakfast time, that he expressed that he is in love with me, and, and he would like to have a relationship, but Colin was very well uh, aware of the culture and the uh, traditions of Afghanistan, and like, we could not go out uh, together, that's not allowed, you are looked down upon, you are considered prostitute, if you are having any boyfriend, um, uh, <laughs> in in especially if you have an American boyfriend who is not from your religion, not from your culture, so that was not allowed. But what we decided to do to see each other was uh, through uh, my brother was always our chaperone, and that's my brother Kasim, my oldest. Uh, I mean, not older than me, but the oldest uh, right after me, brother Kasim. So. Whenever we went out, if we went out to a movie or we went out to dinner, Kasim would always be with us. And that's how our relationship started. So then when I took the Fulbright exam and I passed the exam, and of course Colin knew about this whole thing, and he was, you know, we were having uh, letters. You know, he was back in Connecticut. He's originally from Connecticut. He was back in Connecticut, and he would write me letters, like I would receive every week a letter from him, and we had, you know, some phone conversation, not a lot, and um, he was interested in seeing me and coming to the airport to uh, welcome me, and that was it. You know, I came to, on a Fulbright scholarship, to the United States of America, although Colin had offered before that, hey, you come, I'll pay for the ticket, everything, and uh, we'll get engaged, and we'll get married, and I would say, oh, no, 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 I, I don't want to do that, because of my, you know, the family that I grew up, and my, um, you know, the love that my parents had for me, and also I'd heard a lot of other stories about my other Afghan friends that came to the United States, that the relationship broke, that didn't work, so I did not want to take that chance. But once I came on a Fulbright scholarship, and I, at the Kennedy Airport, Colin was waiting with a uh, bouquet of roses, and, and the first thing he did when we went upstairs to the restaurant to have, um, you know, something to eat was he kneeled down and he said, I want to marry you, and I was, like, shocked. I was happy and also mm, thinking, like, wait a minute, how could I marry you? I, you know, I mean, we, I have known him for, like, 18 months in Afghanistan, but still I had just arrived in my father, my mother, my family, you know, I come from a long tribe of Ishaq Zi, and I said, well, you know what, I love you too, but I can't marry you because you are not Muslim, and that is when he said, look, because of um, you, I will, what does it take? I said, well, you have to say, like, la ilaha illa Muhammad, so we have to be in the presence of an imam and all that, so um, he made sure that he uh, performed that ceremony with the only one mosque that at that time was in Washington, D.C., and the imam was Imam Faisal, if you've all heard the name, Imam Faisal, Raouf Faisal, who wanted to build the Grand Zero Mosque, was his father. I didn't know that. I found that later on. Was the, um, he was from Egypt, and he was the only imam in Washington, D.C. that we went, and uh, Colin um, did the ritual and uh, signed the paper and um, was invited to the Islamic faith because in Islam, you cannot marry um, a man from another religion, but a woman, uh, I mean, a man could marry a woman from another religion because those are all Abrahamic religions and any woman could marry um, uh, Jewish or, uh, I mean, any man could marry a Jewish woman or a Christian woman, but a woman cannot. So then I was happy and I said, oh, I'm going to send this to my father. My father would be really happy because there's a belief that if uh, you invite uh, an infidel to your religion, your um, uh, seventh uh, generation will go to heaven. That's a belief, the, the Muslim belief. So 
I, I was very happy, but my, um, you know, knowing me, uh, I told all, at that time I was a teacher at uh, Bridgeport University, um, just a part-time teaching, and Colin was a student advisor um, at Bridgeport University. That's before I go to my school. Uh, I had like a subbing job, you know, for a few days. And I told the students that Colin has become Muslim, and these were all Arab students from Saudi Arabia, from um, different, you know, Egypt, different countries. And they came on a Friday, um, knocked on the door and said, hey, brother, we have heard that you're Muslim, come. And, and Colin said, no, thank you. And, and Colin tore all the paper, and it was unfortunate, and I had to cry because I didn't even get to send it to my father. Um, but that was how it ended. But listen, I was committed to Colin and to our love, and we got married on August 20th, 1977. Uh, in Stratford, Connecticut, and, and uh, we're still married, and it's been 44 years. And uh, since then, I've had five wonderful children, and uh, I am an Afghan-American mother of five amazing children uh, that I'm proud of, and um, a wonderful husband who is very supportive and uh, great than any other Muslim men that I could have married in Afghanistan or anywhere else. So basically, your family pretty much disowned you. Yes. And you had, other than I think your brother, you, you had like no connection, no communication with your family for, you know, several years. And then, then what happened in 1979? What happened in 1979, as you all know, that the Russian took over Afghanistan and... Um, once that happened and, you know, my two uh, cousins were executed, one was a cleric of the entire city of Kandahar and very well known in the whole country of Afghanistan. And he was invited by the Turkey government and thrown out of the plane. Um, that's how they killed him. And the other one became a Marxist, and he was also killed later, um, uh, you know, and, and they put him in jail during the other um, uh, president uh, um, time, and uh, both Marxists, um, the presidents, they were pro-Russian. So my father, who was also a well-known person and, and they were after him to you know assassinate him uh, he had to flee the country uh, playing um, a role of an old sick man with the support of um, uh, the Pakistani embassy um, he had to come from Afghanistan to Pakistan with the help of my brother Qasim um, because th this old man, you know, through the border, he had to wear a mask and uh, pretend that he was very sick. And then he came and joined the freedom fighters in Pakistan and he was one of the leaders in exile in Pakistan um, in 1979. And then um, two years later, uh, uh, a year later, in 1980, I got, um, I thought my parents, from 1977, where I got married to Colin, and then the Russians were coming, and the news was all over that, you know, many people were assassinated. I thought my father was gone, my family was demolished. It was the worst time of my life uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the, my marriage with Colin because of love, and then I left my loving parents and my home, and uh, what is happening to my country, to my parents. I had no news from them for a year almost. And then after a year, uh, the paper, um, you know, the news uh, from my brother by letters would come, we're okay, you know, it's very dangerous here, we don't know from day to day um, if we are going to be alive or dead. And then that was in 1979 that my dad, with the help of the freedom fighters, uh, and my brother, Qasim, came to Pakistan and then um, one day, Colin brought a telegram to the house and said, hey, 
um, you know, there's a telegram from your father. This is after I'm thinking that my dad is gone and dead and, and there's lots of tears and I attended a um, new degree in counseling and guidance and, you know, just to, to, um, to be more whole and not go down the drain for my own health. I was getting counseling and plus also uh, was getting a master's degree in guidance and counseling. And my husband came, that was when my daughter was born, Jessica, and she was only like um, two months old, that your um, father is, uh, you know, needs your help. And I was like, you know, when they call it reborn, it was just like, is he alive? And he said, yes, look, read the telegram. So I did. And my father had put a number to call him. And it was all, you know, like their time and our time is different. There's a nine hours difference. So I did call. And my dad, for the first time after three years, I heard his voice uh, that, you know, I mean, I thought I was totally, like they said a shiva, and I was dead to him, and he didn't want to do anything with me because he sent me a letter after I invited both my mom and dad for our wedding, and they said, I have nothing to do with you, you broke my back, and um, how could you do this, and you know, you went out of religion, out of um, culture, out of tradition, and married a kafir, kafir is like an infidel, um, and now, um, you know, that was it, and then I get this letter, and I mean, the telegram, and I called him, and I heard his voice, and it was just an incredible, incredible feeling of happiness, and uh, he said, I need your help, so I call it love and redemption, and love overcomes everything, you know, because the love of, of a father to a daughter, the love of a husband to a wife, and it is through love that we all um, come back together and create unity and become unified. And yes, then Colin and I got on the bandwagon and started with the help of um, World Church Services and uh, um, Jewish synagogue in Ohio and a um, Methodist church and a Catholic church and got my um, 13 members of my family, my grandmother who at the time was uh, 75 and uh, my mom, my dad, uh, my brothers and sisters and my brother's wife all to the United States of America and we were living in Lancaster, Ohio at the time. Yeah, this is my father when he was young, and he was the president of Chamber of Commerce. Actually, this is right in front of his office that he had taken this picture. And uh, I was very, very proud of him for his progressive nature of how he gave me the life that I have today in many ways, because if it wasn't for his push for education for me, I would have been dead and gone. Um, so I, you know, that's that's my dad, Muhammad Nabi Yusufi. And this is, uh, again, my father is right between uh, Karzai's father, who was the president of Afghanistan, and they were cousins, and um, the King Zahir Shah, who was right there. And uh, my father at that time was the president of the wool factory in Afghanistan. And it was the first wool factory, and uh, there was a ribbon cutting that my dad invited Zahir Shah to come and cut the ribbon and that was also a dramatic shift in our life because my mom for the first time had to take her burqa away and welcome the king to our city Kandahar. And this is my wedding day uh, at uh, both these beautiful people Dan Straka and Barbara Straka. Dan was the Dean of University in Bridgeport and Barbara was a communication professor at the University of Bridgeport. And we, Colin and I, got married at their backyard, at their beautiful home in Stratford, Connecticut. Um, Colin and Dan were best friends and uh, Colin's parents felt that the wedding was way too soon because I just came. I came in July 14th and we got married on August 20th in his parents uh, both coming you know they were they were english american and they mm, were not willing to have the wedding so soon and not have their arrangement and all that so they did come to the wedding but uh, barbara and dan 
um, graciously offered their house and we got married at their house. And this is my whole family. Well, most of my family, not a whole family because my mom is not in this picture, but my siblings and my brother's wife, Najiba, and my dad and I, the first Christmas that we celebrated in Lancaster, Ohio, for all the kids, and, you know, this was all new to them, Christmas. I mean, in Afghanistan, especially in Kandahar, they never celebrate Christmas. And that's not part of their religion, but it was more of a commercial holiday. The kids loved the gifts, and it was a happy, wonderful time that we had with our family. And this is the picture of uh, my mom, my grandmother, and my brother's wife, and my siblings, and my two brothers, my sisters. Um, all together right the day before that they left Pakistan for Afghanistan. I mean, for not Afghanistan, I'm sorry, for America. <laughs> and this is when they arrived. In the morning they arrived, of course, and they're all in their Afghan garbs and their way of clothing. But in the afternoon, my in-laws were also there from Connecticut, um, Dan and Joan, um, Colin's parents, and they invited all of them to a very wonderful restaurant and uh, so everybody changed and we're getting ready this is in front of our house in Lancaster Ohio um, that to go now to dinner uh, my in-laws are there my mom and uh, my dad and my little daughter Jessica who was this time two years old and my brother Hamid and Farida and Afifa my sisters and brother and this is Betsy Ross. Most of you probably know her. She was running uh, for lieutenant governor at the time. And we are in Seneca Falls for a celebration of the women's rights issues uh, with, uh, of course, Patricia Ireland, which was the president of NOW, National Organization of Women, and my wonderful activist friends who passed away, God bless her soul, Patricia, her name is also Patricia Luciano, and myself. I was the president of the women's group at the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Chirac, and we celebrated in Seneca Falls, and for the first time I met Hillary Clinton there, which was wonderful. And this is a picture of a young boy, eight years old, Javed, who is a refugee from Kunduz, Afghanistan, and these are his parents and his brother, that Colin and I found in Camp Moria screaming outside on the skirts of, um, like on the road close to Camp Moria, and because the entire family was frostbitten, they had walked for 24 hours from Iran through Turkey, you know, on the mountains. And the snow, they said, got harder and harder, and it was all the way up to Javid's neck. And Javid's hands were in the snow, and it was all frostbitten. And um, the doctors were predicting that his hands were, you know, not be ever the same because they were all frostbitten and bleeding and swollen like melons, you know. It was just a very, very shocking, um, you know, scene that Colin and I discover. And Colin picked the boy up, and we took him to the health clinic where I was translating in Greece, in Camp Moria, Lesbos, as you probably all know about the refugee crisis, that there are 70 million refugees on the, you know, move, and um, the world is not doing anything about it. It's, it's really, I mean, a, a, a very, very um, heartbreaking situation for these men and women because of war, because of atrocity, because of climate change, because of what is happening in their countries, they're all on the move and they want to find a safe place and go to Europe or come to America. So we've been working with them for about um, now five years and my family and I and Colin, we have made nine trips to Lesbos, Greece, Thessaloniki, Greece, uh, Chios, Greece, and uh, Athens, Greece. We presently have a safe center for women, and we need everybody's attention to call for this reason of why should people like you and I, and they are wonderful people, uh, have to live that kind of life. In Some of them have lost their children, their husbands, their wives in the Aegean Sea. And um, it just breaks my heart. And we were just planning to go again, but unfortunately the COVID situation has uh, prevented us. But we do have our center and we pay teachers to educate them 
with English classes, Greek classes, and computer classes. And um, we also have just recently, you know, partnered with another uh, team to, called Team Humanity of Denmark, where they are the rescue and relief uh, people right there on the ground. And we've been raising funds and uh, sending them money to help these poverty-stricken despair refugees. And this is my family, my five wonderful children, my amazing husband, Colin, which I call them my solid rock. It's uh, Jessica Woodhouse, my oldest daughter, um, who is an attorney at um, New York City, and then me, Colin, and uh, Sarah, Evan, uh, Sophia, and Alexandra. And they've all been to Lesbos and Athens, Greece with us and participate in our uh, humanitarian missions, uh, different times, different years, and uh, still very involved. Uh, they call us the social justice, uh, one of my friend Artemis Tchaikovsky, the social justice of the Kardashian family, because they're very involved with this humanitarian work of refugees, and I'm grateful to that. And, of course, this is my book, Latifa Unveiled, uh, by Latifa Yusufi Woodhouse, which was just uh, recently in September published on Alan Kurdi. Alan Kurdi was the young um, Syrian boy that was washed to the shore um, on the Aegean Sea, and um, that made the news all over the world and in the United States, and that is what motivated Colin and I and my children to say, wait a minute, we are a member of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Shelter Rock. We have made a difference through the Shelter Rock amazing work because of being Unitarian and also the, you know, blessing that we have with the money that Shelter Rock has. We've made a difference in the, um, the Pentagon Papers. We have made a difference in many, many advocacy and uh, um, difference in the, 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 the elections of the United States. You know, the, there's, there's a lot of money given to very good causes, workers' rights, human rights, through our congregation. And we said we cannot sit still. But Colin and I and my children, we start our meeting on our own. Of course, the congregation helped and gave um, at different times, $200,000 through our service committee, which is the Unitarian Universal Service Committee, to the refugee crisis. And they give money to all crises to our large grant program. But this is our family foundation called Share Humanity USA. And please do go to sharehumanityusa.org, um, which is our foundation that started in 2017. And we need everybody's attention, everybody's help because it is working for refugees, all refugees, in Greece, in the Balkans, and everywhere else, and also in the United States. And uh, that is what our um, work is right now for rescue and relief and also for stability and um, giving them, uh, not giving them a fish, but teaching them how to fish for themselves so they could have stable life like we all have. Okay, we, we are actually out of time, but I'm going to take a few extra minutes because we, we have some really great questions. Um, and if you could just answer them briefly so everyone, you know, has a chance to, uh, to hear their, their questions. Um, Susan is asking what your dad's educational background was and how was his relationship with your mom, how, how did he treat her? Okay. My dad's education background was he had gone to college and he was sent from Afghanistan to al Hazar University, which is in Egypt. And his background was mostly in theology, but he was very bright. He taught social studies. He taught algebra and um, geometry, as I said before. And he was the um, headmaster of the school and then became the principal of the school and then after that he got involved with politics and he was the president of Chamber of Commerce, he was the mayor of Zabul and from that then he came back to the United States and in the United States because of his religious background of his 20 generation of his great great grandfathers, the community of New York uh, 
and from all over um, the United States, the Muslim surrounded him and said, you are our imam. So they bought him a mosque in Flushing, New York, and for 25 years, he uh, was the imam of that mosque and uh, did a lot of wedding ceremonies and funerals and he was very involved with the politics of New York City, you know, through Collins. Collins was a commissioner for New York City, and um, he met with Mayor Koch, and he established relationship, and always he created an um, Afghan immigration uh, Islamic center for um, the Afghan refugees here in New York. Um, he was very, very active and very involved, and we would always go um, to in front of the United Nation and have demonstration against Russia um, for Afghanistan because the Russian were in Afghanistan those years. And his relationship with my mom. Um, he was a wonderful, supportive husband, but his wife was much too young. She, her education was only after fifth grade. She didn't know much about child rearing or being a good wife, but the um, requirements and obligation of this big family was, okay, welcome. The, you know, there's a chapter you will read um, in my book if you uh, kindly purchase the book. Uh, by the way, now the book is uh, going to be on three different versions, which is paperback, audiobook and Kindle version. And if you purchase the book, the little profit that the book is making or proceeds net is going directly to Share Humanity USA. So um, in the book, there's a chapter about wedding, like uh, the first day when the bride comes, when my mom came to her um, in-law's house or her husband's house, they all live together in this big compound, is the kitchen to say welcome and now you're going to be the cook, the cleaner, uh, and the wife, and the submissive, you know, human being. So even though that is the requirements of the family, but dad was very kind, like in the book it says, my mom did not have enough food um, when she was pregnant on me to eat. They would give her a little bread and tea in the morning or a little, um, you know, spinach and eggplants or whatever for lunch with a piece of bread or a little uh, rice with some gravy for dinner. But dad always secretly, because he was also had to be part of his mother and father and keep that relationship, but would bring her food to support her nutrition and to be kind to her. Um, that, that lasted for quite a while. But then when my dad got involved with politics, his life became very different. Uh, he was very political and very, um, you know, involved. And so he was hardly ever home. And mom really ran the household and uh, welcomed all the guests. On any given day, there will be 20, 25 people in our house that mom and grandma would be cooking and preparing food. All right. Unfortunately, we're going to have to go. <laughs> we could go. I could go on for, I think, with you for another hour or two, Latifa. But we're going to have to cut it off here. Uh, this is being recorded, so if you want uh, want to go back and look at it or share it with your friends, um, please do. But Tifa, thank you so much for coming today. This is really wonderful. I uh, really appreciate it. And thank you, everybody, for being here. And we will see you at the next one.